Right, so we conclude the conference and the session with, I'm sure, will be a very good, entertaining talk by Lenny Saskin, who will tell us about, I think the title is Three Aspects of Complexity. Thank you. All right. About uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I became extremely hypoglycemic. That means you get very, very low blood pressure, blood uh, sugar. And um, it had a very funny effect on my lectures. I would find it very difficult to get started, really. Just um, blood pressure would go down as soon as I stood up here. It's happening now. And I found two ways to get over it. One of them was to have a beer just before I spoke. Okay. <laughs> Not so easy to do at KITP. The other was always to prepare myself for something to read, something to read to begin the lecture. Turns out this condition only would last for about three minutes until I got started. So my lectures lately, over the last few years, have either started with a beer or me, <laughs> or me reading something. Today I had something to read. Um, I, th I think I'm going to read it. Uh, I don't really need it right now, but nevertheless I'm going to read it anyway, um, just to get myself started. So thank you. Thank you for en uh, enduring what I have to do. Okay, so complexity. That's all I speak about these days, complexity. This is probably going to end my career, both because I'm 80 years old and secondly because at some point somebody's going to say, let's stop hearing about complexity. Okay, complexity is very hard. It's really hard. It's much harder than entanglement. But my own opinion is that it's every bit as important to quantum gravity and black holes. So we'd like to find an easier way to visualize it. One hope was to follow Michael Nielsen's idea of a complexity geometry, uh, take the space of states or the space of unitary operators or whatever it is we're interested in, and give it some sort of non-standard metric. Non-standard metric which represents the difficulty of going from one point to another uh, by acting with some restricted class of operations. This in mathematical terms means a right invariant metric for example, on the space SU2 to the n, which is the space of uh, state, not the space of unitary operators of n qubits, equipped with some appropriate penalty factors for moving in hard directions. But as you might expect, the geometry that you get in this way is also extremely difficult and hard to understand. Incidentally, if it were easy to understand, we would use it and solve all complexity problems. Well, we're not going to solve all complexity problems, and so the geometry itself is very hard to think about. Um, what, in lieu of that, what we would like to do is to find some very simplified model. Simplified model that, uh, that makes it easy to analyze, but still captures the basic things that we think complexity should do. I won't justify it in this talk, but there is a simplified toy version of complexity geometry, and it's nothing but the hyperbolic plane, the hyperbolic disk, where the center of the disk represents uh, the unit operator, and points away from the disk represent um, unitary operators of larger complexity. The further away you go from the center of the disk, the, the more complex the operator is. There are two ways to think about the relative complexity, relative complexity, ours, relative complexity. If I have two unitary operators, I can ask how hard, or how many gates does it take to go from one to the other by operating, let's say, by left multiplication. And uh, that number of minimal number of gates to go from one to the other is called the relative complexity. And um, you can think of it in two ways. You can think of it two points on the hyperbolic plane or on the complexity geometry. The way Nielsen thought about it was as the um, geodesic distance between the points, the relative complexity. The way I like to think about it, which is completely equivalent, is to imagine a non-relativistic particle moving on the geometry and think about the minimal action for the particle to go from one point to another. They are completely consist uh, consistent with each other. Uh, the action point of view suggests something which turns out to be true. It suggests that if you're thinking about an ensemble of theories, like in SYK, you can start out with a whole bunch of points at the origin to follow the complexity and let them flow away by the natural dynamics induced by the metric of the, uh, of the space. 
let them flow away, and the complexity just turns out to be the entropy of that cloud of particles. As the cloud of particles expands, the entropy grows, and the entropy, or the average, and the entropy grows, and that entropy is, in fact, the average complexity of the points that the cloud is covering. So that turned out to be a somewhat easy way to think about complexity, and I will use it. Uh, one of the outcomes of this view is that there's a second law of complexity. I'm told now that there is a first law of complexity, is that right? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. The second law just means, very simply, that there's a kind of pressure on systems or a kind of force on systems to push them toward larger complexity. Uh, in the same way, or a similar way, to the way there's a force that pushes systems to larger entropy. What I'm going to tell you today is that that force is nothing but ordinary gravity. So that's what we're going to do today. Another preliminary. One of the preliminary is what I call the momentum size correspondence. This is not as well known as it should be. It's been going on for some 50 years now, mostly in my own writings. I've listed here the, some history of the subject. Um, I'll say it as simply and as quickly as I can. In a quantum field theory, a particle has a fixed size, which in this context means number of constituent elementary particles. For example, a proton has three quarks. And whether the proton is going fast or going slow, it always has three quarks. Now, that's not exactly true. Those who know about deep inelastic scattering and so forth know about something called the we parton effect and so forth uh, that says the number of particles that you will see in a proton does depend on its energy, but gradually, logarithmically. Um, in gravity, by contrast, you could say it in a number of ways. You could say all partons are we. Or you can just say the number of partons in a particle grows with its momentum in such, and the number of partons, I'll give the name the size of the particle. The size of the particle, or the size of the object, grows with momentum. That's a shocking idea because it seems to violate Lorentz invariance. If you ask me about it later, I'll tell you why it doesn't. Um, and in particular, as I said, the number of constituents can, can be identified with what uh, we tend to call size in SYK kind of theories and so forth, and we'll come to that. So, momentum is proportional to size. And of course, momentum has units, one over length. Size is dimensionless, so there has to be a uh, factor connecting them. It has to, the factor has to have units of length, and I'll call it beta. Now, you say, well, beta we already use for inverse temperature. Yes, we'll come to it in a moment, but for the moment, it's just a conversion factor from size to momentum. All right, now how are we going to examine this? We're going to examine this in a particular theory, everybody's favorite theory today, SYK, and it's, uh, uh, and it's bulk dual. And I'll take its bulk dual to be a near extremal rise to Nordstrom black hole. You can call it JT gravity. JT gravity is basically the dimensional reduction of the near extremal black hole. I like to think about it in the near extremal black hole just because I'm familiar with it. Okay, near extremal black hole is just a long throat. It's a long throat which at one end has a horizon, the other end opens up into asymptotic space, and in fact there's a fairly sharp transition between the two. The sharp transition happens at a point where there's a potential barrier that particles from the inside experience when they try to get out and particles from the outside experience when they try to get in, and it makes a sharp dynamical boundary between the inside and the outside. And if you like, you can try to cut off the geometry and replace the outside by a boundary uh, condition or a boundary term in the action. That boundary term in the action is the York term, sometimes called the gibbons hawking York term. I'm not sure why. It was definitely York who invented it. Uh, and as I said, it's called the, York, the gibbons hawking York term. It's a term in the action. Let me just, just remind you of that. Um, and there's a dictionary, a dictionary connecting SYK to the uh, near extremal black hole. I'll tell you what it is very quickly. The uh, horizon size, the, the horizon, horizon radius, I'll call R plus. 
the outer horizon, but for the near extremal, the outer and the inner are almost the same. And the inverse of that is the SYK energy scale, J. The entropy of the black hole, which is basically the area of this uh, tube, is N, the N of, uh, of SYK. is N times a number. The number depends on uh, lu q. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that is. But it's basically just N. And if you know the radius of the horizon, you can compute its area. If you know the entropy, you can compute the Newton constant. And the Newton constant, I'm talking about the four-dimensional Newton constant now. G is 1 over J squared N. And the mass of the black hole, the ordinary mass of the black hole, is N times J. And finally, the York-Gibbons-Hawking action associated with the boundary is just the Schwarzian action that, uh, that we've become familiar with in recent times. OK, now we're going to apply a perturbation W at the boundary. A perturbation, what could it be? Just some operator, where it's a simple operator. And the simplest thing would be a single fermion, a single fermion, S Y K, single fermion operator. And that'll create a particle. The particle, well, what will it do? It'll fall into the black hole. It'll accelerate as it goes down due to the gravitational attraction. And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in understanding the reason for that gravitational attraction. We can go to the SYK. This has got nothing to do, obviously, with gravity. It's pure quantum mechanics. And we can study what the evolution of that perturbation is. The perturbation is generated by an operator, W. W evolves with time. And the time evolution has an effect which we've found out by various calculations is that the perturbation grows in size. And it grows in size in a particular way, in a tree-like way. By tree-like, I don't necessarily mean that the diagrams are, have no loops. I mean that it proliferates uh, exponentially. This is just a simple toy example here where it grows uh, like a, I suppose it's a sort of sideways, what do the Jewish people call it, a menorah. Uh, yeah, but it, uh, I would think of it as a tree. And it grows exponentially. Exponentially with what, incidentally? Time, not necessarily time, but with depth of the circuit, number of layers. Is the number of layers proportional to the time? We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but the size at any given time is the number of leaves of the tree. Number of leaves of the tree means the number of endpoints. The complexity of the growing operator can be identified with the number of vertices. You can think of the vertices as gates, the number of steps that it took to get there. And the complexity uh, I'll think of as the number of vertices in the diagram. They grow together. And in fact, because it grows exponentially, um, well, first of all, you can see from the picture that the size is proportional to the derivative of the complexity. That's just every time you add a layer of complexity, you add one layer of complexity adds to the size. And so one equation that we use is that the size is the complexity dt. But the other thing is that as, because it's grow incidentally, it only grows exponentially through the, until the scrambling time. At the scrambling time, it saturates. But up to the scrambling time, because it grows exponentially, the size and the complexity are proportional to each other. So I'm going to simply use the letter C for both size and complexity, because everything we're going to say is in this pre-scrambling time. Uh, OK, now, is the parameter tau time? No, in general, it's not. You can imagine a variable rate computer where the computer is just doing its usual thing, but at a variable rate. Why would the computer, this particle falling into the black hole and uh, evolving according to these computations, why would it be a variable rate? Two reasons. First of all, because it's falling into a potential well with uh, time, um, you know, what did Einstein call it? Time uh, dilation? Right. Hmm? Sorry? I think it's called time dilation. Yeah, I, I just didn't want to confuse it with Lorentz uh, dilation. It's redshift. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. But also because it's going faster and faster as it goes down there, 
it also has some Lorentz time dilation. So there's a variable rate, as seen from infinity, there's a variable rate, and if the size is d, is d, uh, d complexity dt, as I argued before, sorry, d complexity d tau, with tau being circuit depth, then we have to introduce this factor beta tilde. I'll tell you what beta tilde is in a minute, but it's basically the rate parameter or the inverse rate that the computer is computing with. That beta tilde turns out to be from direct calculations, I, I won't do the calculations here, but it turns out to be an interesting thing. As the system moves down through the throat, it comes to different places, and that beta tilde is the inverse temperature of a black hole whose horizon was right at the position that we're, we're talking about. So as something moves down that throat, it experiences different places, and that rate is the temperature of a black hole whose horizon was up at the point in question. You'll have to take it from me that that's true. We can call it the inverse energy scale. And so we have an equation. Size is equal to beta tilde dc dt, t being asymptotic time. Now let's come back to the size-momentum relationship. Uh, the size-momentum relationship that we'll use here is based on a guess. It was a guess that, uh, actually it was a guess of Ying's, in fact, uh, that I got wrong the first time around. The C stands for size. C, size, size, C-I-Z-E, size. C -I -Z -E, size. Uh, and complexity. Okay, so size, the guess was that size was proportional to momentum. That's the momentum-size relationship but with the conversion factor between them, that same beta tilde, okay? Go back a step, look at that. C, size is equal to beta tilde P, and go back, size is beta tilde DC DT. If you combine those two and do a little bit of difficult algebra, you will find that DC by DT is nothing but the momentum. Now, I couldn't prove any of this, this was a guess, However, this equation, P equals dc dt, was proved or argued for in a more, uh, far more rigorous version of similar things by Lynn Maldacena and Zhao. Uh, I wasn't on that paper. LS uh, there stands for somebody else. I don't know who. Um, that momentum is the time derivative of the size. So I refer you to Lynn Maldacena and Zhao for uh, the serious arguments about why this should be true. But it's kind of interesting. If you work the equations backward, you can prove the equation above from the equation below. And so I would say that the guess was correct. All right, so here's, here's the setup. The setup is we give a little kick up at the near the far region over there, apply a fermion operator to the boundary, a particle is created which falls into the black hole, but something else happens, and the something else that happens is by action and reaction, Newton's third law, a kick is given to the, uh, to the boundary, and the boundary moves off with a slow velocity. Both these things happen, and by Newton's third law, the momentum of the particle going one way and the momentum of the boundary going the other way are equal and opposite. Okay. These things can be confirmed and can be given a rigorous basis by the Lin Maldacena and Zhao argument. I'm just giving them a, um, an intuitive uh, idea. So look at that equation, P equals dc dt. It almost looks very Newtonian. Momentum is like velocity. Velocity is a time derivative position. But C is not a position. C is just complexity or size. So this velocity that's there is a kind of velocity, but it's a velocity of uh, complexity growth. It has nothing to do with uh, velocity of a particle or velocity, you know, dx dt, or does it? All right, so to see that it actually does, I want to use the so-called complexity volume connection. And the, connect, uh, the connection is that the complexity geometrically or through gravity and so forth, 
is connected to the volume of a maximal slice, but that just means the space, uh, that, that in this context it just means the wormhole itself, not the wormhole, the throat itself, that the complexity is the volume divided by the Newton constant divided by the ADS radius. That by now is a somewhat standard equation among a handful of people who think about these things. The volume is the area of the throat times the length of the throat, and the length of the throat is the distance from the horizon to the boundary. So that's A times L divided by G times R plus. So on the other hand, A over G is what? It's the entropy. A over G, area over G is the entropy divided by L over R plus. And if you go back to the dictionary, 1 over R plus is J. So what do we have? We have a complexity is equal to J, S, which is N, J, N times L. J and N are constants. So the complexity is simply related to the length of the, um, of the throat. In other words, it's the position of the boundary relative to the horizon. We can read off now that P equals dc dt translates into P equals j n times the time derivative of the length of that throat. In other words, the velocity of the boundary relative to the um, to the horizon. So in fact, not only does this have a Newtonian flavor, it looks really very Newtonian, but it's not the momentum of the particle we're talking about, it's the momentum of the boundary. Well, that's okay, they're equal and opposite. So we're okay, we still can understand the particle and the boundary. We can read off from P equals J times N what the mass of the boundary is, namely it's J times N, and that is the correct uh, magnitude for the mass of the Schwarzian boundary of uh, the JT gravity. So that fits. We now have a picture. Particle falls in. Uh, the complexity grows. The size grows. The complexity grows. The boundary recoils. Particle falls in. And we can either compute the momentum as a function of time by computing the momentum of the boundary, which can be done in a Newtonian way because the boundary is so heavy, or we can follow the particle as it falls in. Well, let's differentiate this equation once more, P equals dc dt, and then use the fact that P, the momentum of the particle, or the momentum of the boundary, P dot, is nothing but the force on the particle. All right, so we have a Newton's equation describing the motion of the boundary or the particle, and um, we can try to analyze it. All right, now, you say, wait a minute, what does all of this have to do with quantum mechanics and SYK and uh, calculations of complexity or size? At the moment, it doesn't seem to have much to do with that, but we can now try to connect them. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to calculate the momentum by solving either Newton's equations or Einstein, uh, you know, just Einstein's equation for the motion of a particle in a metric. We can do that uh, on one side, and then the other side will calculate the complexity or the size and compare the two results calculated by strict SYK methods. All right, so I, I can do the easy problem. The easy problem was just calculating. Actually, I don't even think I did it. I think Ying did it. Um, calculate the momentum of the particle as it falls through the throat. Uh, what do we use for the force, incidentally? We use Newton's force. M, little m, big M. Big M is the mass of the boundary. Little m is the mass of the particle. G divided by r plus squared. r plus, incidentally, is not the distance from the horizon to the, uh, it's got to do with the area. And if you think about Newton and so forth, and, and one of our squared potentials, the thing that goes in, the thing which is r squared in the denominator, is not really the distance from the sun to the, uh, to the earth. It's the area of the sphere at the radius of the earth. That's the important, you know, flux, gauss, and all that sort of stuff. So, in fact, this is the Newtonian formula. You plug that in, you calculate P of T as a function of time using the full apparatus of relativity, 
and you find that P of T, the momentum falling in, is 4 beta. Now beta is the temperature of the black, inverse temperature of the black hole. This is a pure gravity calculation, 1 over r plus squared, cinch of 2 pi t over beta. Now next, we want to calculate the complexity or the size uh, just purely from SYK. No gravity, no geometry, just pure SYK. That was done by Qi and, uh, and Stryker. And um, here's the answer. C of t, complexity or size, is 1 plus 2j squared beta squared over pi squared sin squared pi t over beta. P and C, of course, don't, uh, don't match, but that's okay. They're not supposed to match. What's supposed to match is C dot, the time derivative of C, and in fact, not only do they match, they match perfectly. So uh, this is a bit of evidence for something which... Yeah, they match. Oh, okay, before I say what it's evidence for, let me see, how are we doing? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, we're not going to get through this talk, but that's okay. Um, good. So here's a space-time picture of the same thing. Here is the, uh, the uh, I guess you can call it the JT picture of uh, the black hole, of the two-sided black hole. The green lines are the... Um, boundary, the dynamical boundary. They moved in a little bit away from the mathematical boundary of ADS, as you know. Here we've shot in a particle. Well, shot in a particle may be too strong. We just dropped the particle from the boundary. The particle falls in to the horizon. At the same time, it gives a little bit of a kick to the boundary. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that, uh, that the green line has gotten bumped a little bit to the right? And the result is that what we call T right, which was up a little bit, gets moved down. That, of course, is the origin of a number of things, including traversable wormholes. But right here, it's just what it is. Oh, here's another picture. Here's the same thing. Uh, so you can see a little better. Let's uh, follow what's going on in time. Now, time, I'm going to use the two-sided time, the two-sided time uh, that uh, goes down on the right side, up on the left side. If we follow the system as a function of time, and I'm mostly interested in the right side, we see that at any given time, the particle crosses the equal time surface, the boundary is there on the equal time surface, and they separate. They separate. You can also see that the length of that uh, uh, distance from the horizon to the boundary varies. It varies a little bit because of the kick to the, um, to the boundary. It varies a little bit. That's this velocity that, uh, that it gets. And what I will tell you now is, curiously, incidentally, the origin of gravity, the gravitational pull of the black hole is a little bit curious here. It really shows up in this language as a repulsion between the boundary and the, uh, and the particle. Um, it's, again, this equal and opposite uh, momentum, which is a gauge condition. That, uh, that the total momentum has to vanish, blah, blah, blah. But that's a sort of space-time picture of what's going on. And it's just that that little kick to the boundary represents not only the Newtonian motion of the boundary, but also the time rate of change or the rate of change of complexity. So we see that there's a close connection. Uh, this picture here just represents um, a uh, complexity geometry picture of the evolution of uh, the W operator, a little kick. I won't, I won't go into that here. I'll just... Uh, uh. Okay, so here's what I conclude from this. Gravity is a complexity force, not an entropic force. It's a complexity force related to the second law of complexity, not an entropic force related to the second law of thermodynamics. We can confirm this in a number of other ways, which I have, which are here. If I had more time in the talk, I would go through them. In particular, there are contexts where gravity acts where there's no question of entropy. Uh, a planet falling to a frozen cold star, a star with no entropy at all, gravitates. There's no entropic force. 
In fact, it might even circulate around the star, going in, going out, going in, going out. The second law of thermodynamics doesn't allow that. The second law of complexity does. Complexity is something which can time vary, in particular in integrable systems. The motion of a, uh, of a planet around the sun is an integrable system. Complexity and size very definitely can oscillate. I had another example here, but I won't go through it. But um, that, I guess I have to stop here. I'd love to go on for another 10 minutes, but I won't. Uh, but that is my conclusion, that the second law of complexity, the, the tendency or uh, the kind of force, the analog of an entropic force, except for complexity, is what I suspect strongly is at the root of Newtonian or ordinary gravity. Uh, finished? So maybe you have a chance to say more, but any questions? So, very naive one. So does the second law of complexity not apply to non-gravitational systems? Or? So does it apply to non-gravitational systems? I suppose it applies to any complexity in general, very generally. So then where it does one a quantum extract computer? the... Hmm? So the gravity... So why does one extract that to correspond to gravity? Oh, I, I think that, oh, I think it probably also corresponds to electromagnetic forces. I haven't thought very much about it, but um, uh, no, I think it's a general feature of forces in general, but I just applied it now to a situation which um, is well under control, namely the SYK uh, uh, gravitational system. I haven't thought about it very much in uh, other contexts. So, yeah, I, I think it's more general than that. Um, you can ask me about this picture in particular. Daniel, who, who is Daniel? <coughs> you recognize this picture? Yeah. Absolutely. How do you think I got it? I, I, hack, the, uh, I hacked your computer. <laughs> How do you think I got it? Yeah, it's a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what this is about if you want. But okay. Actually, yeah, my question was going to be like, say you had another 10 minutes, what were you going to say? I was going to talk about this. <laughs> uh, well, I talk, do you want me to end? Uh, I don't want to take up your time with another 10 minutes of talk uh, if there are questions. Hmm? Okay. Um, well, can, I, can I make a suggestion yeah. before yeah. you do that? Is there any pressing question before you go? Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay. Okay. okay, then it's all yours. All right. The, um, I misled, misled you a little bit about saying that size is complex. It, it is. It, it is. But it's a very, very early time manifestation of complexity. So early. And complexity really has its teeth when you're talking about long times. So the question is, can you say anything about very long times? Uh, this picture is from Daniel's talk. Daniel Harlow, but also Daniel Jaffer's uh, this paper. And it uh, argues, correctly I'm sure, that the quantum degree of freedom describing the SYK system is just the length between the boundaries. Length between the boundaries, from what I told you, can be translated into complexity, but there's also a Hamiltonian governing it. There's the Hamiltonian, P squared, plus e uh, 2, I don't even know where the 2 comes from, e to the minus l, the distance. This actually is describing the gravitational interaction between the two boundaries. It happens to be repulsive. It's a funny thing, these boundaries tend to repel rather than attract gravitationally, but it is gravitational, attract, uh, gravitational interaction. And uh, it's governed by a Hamiltonian with a force, e to the minus l. Okay, Here's, here was my own picture before, um, while I was preparing my talk, I saw Daniel's talk and I screenshot it. This was my picture, it's basically the same picture, with the exception of the factor of 2 in front of e to the minus l. Incidentally, all of this wisdom uh, uh, is largely due at this, from this point on to Henry, Henry Lin. 
Um, when I read the, the paper of the two Daniels, I found something very complicated at this point um, for the force law. I, was that a mistake? I, it was a mistake, yeah. Uh, Henry calculated it, and it's just e to the minus L. It's kind of repulsion between the two of them. It likes to favor large separation. And that is, it's, it's a manifestation of the Schwarzian action. Um, what I wanted to say about it, yeah, well, of course, what it means is that uh, the system, the length, the, the fictitious particle describing the length, comes in and bounces, and it bounces before it gets to the origin. Uh, the bounce is, of course, just the bounce here in the complexity or the length going from the bottom of the diagram to the top of the diagram. And notice that the length doesn't go to zero in the middle. It reaches some minimum and it goes back out. If you think about this process in terms of the complexity geometry, now if you're not familiar with complexity geometry, this might not mean too much, the rest of what I'm going to say, but uh, the picture that I had thought would make sense for this, for this bounce, was uh, a symmetric picture starting at the origin, starting at the identity operator that corresponds to the thermal field double state, the identity operator, Going up means moving away from the identity operator. Moving down, you're coming into the identity operator, and you certainly you see a bounce in this, uh, in this picture. This picture is purely a version of Nielsen's complexity geometry, very, very simplified. This is the picture you would get. But it's not the right picture. The right picture is this bounce, which never gets to the origin. Uh, the question is, where did the potential term, this e to the minus l, come from? If you are thinking about complexity geometry and thinking that the complexity is the action of this particle, this fictitious particle moving on the complexity geometry, there is no potential energy. The complexity geometry picture is pure kinetic energy. So where did this potential term come from? Well, I wasn't even smart enough to ask the question, let alone answer it. Henry was smart enough for both of them. And here is what, uh, what he realized. If you look at time t equals zero, you see that the complexity never goes quite to zero at time t equals zero. So that means that on this complexity diagram here, the phase point or the point at time t equals zero is not right at the center. The center is the identity operator. You have some complexity. Incidentally, that complexity depends on the temperature. The lower the temperature, the more complexity you have. And so that's the starting point, not the point at the origin. Now, what direction? By the, what direction, I don't mean what direction do you orient the diagram. That doesn't matter. What direction do you put the velocity of the fictitious point at this point, and what determines it? Well, the thing that determines it, go back a step, is the time symmetry of this. The complexity going up in time and going down in time is time symmetric. And the only way to uh, orient the geodesic through that point, which is time symmetric, is to have the trajectory be perpendicular to the separation. OK, so the fictitious particle moves like so on the complexity geometry. And this means that the fictitious particle, fictitious particle has some angular momentum. Impact parameter, angular momentum, and therefore, guess what? Centrifugal force. That centrifugal force is exactly described by this e to the minus l perturbation, or this e to the minus l force. And so, in fact, the full action of this fictitious particle is kinetic energy. This kinetic energy uh, the e to the minus l being the kinetic energy of rotation about the origin. There's more. I think I'll stop at that point there. As I said, the main lesson that I want to draw from this is that gravity, both in both cases, is a complexity. There's no doubt about it in the second case, where the, uh, the growth of the wormhole, there it has nothing whatever to do with, uh, with entropy. Uh, it's, it has to do with complexity. I don't think it's an entropic force. And the evolution of complexity 
is a dynamical process governed by an action principle. That is something somewhat surprising. It surprised me. And uh, that's, that's where we are now. I like this subject because, well, I think it's a very beautiful subject. I think it's a very beautiful subject the way that gravitation in various contexts is driven by the second law of complexity. I think it is worth your attention and I think it is worth further exploration, much further exploration, many, many questions to answer, um, but I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you. So for those of us who also like entanglement, mm -hmm. is oh, that I like it, entanglement. I love it. Is that in there somewhere? Oh, also, you know, I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> I, well, look, the reason that there's so much room for complexity to grow is because there are so many entangled states. So without entanglement, for sure, uh, none of this would fly. But what about like Ryu Takanagi? I mean, if you're getting the geometry and the equations, Henry, the motion. Henry, 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 what's the answer? <laughs> no, Henry. Henry, where are you? Henry, anything to say about that? No. Okay. <laughs> Me neither at the moment. But uh, well, here's what I would say. I would say in a sense, what entanglement is about is about the nature of a state. What complexity seems to be about is also about the nature of a state, but it seems to come in more when asking questions about evolution of states. So entanglement is an aspect of statics, in a sense. Stat by statics, I don't mean things are static. I mean instantaneous states. Whereas it looks to me like, um, like much of gravitational dynamics is driven by this um, growth of complexity. Of now, the growth of horizons which also has its gravitational aspect and can be written in terms of uh, Einstein's equations, happens to be a entropic uh, phenomenon, whereas the growth of the interior of the geometry seems to be a, um, a complexity phenomenon. And the, um, the, and the Newtonian force is sort of somewhere in between. It's a scrambling phenomenon. Uh, it's the short time version of, um, of complexity but it's also got to do with something like thermal equilibrium. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I just find it a little confusing where the boundaries are. So this, the length is infinite if I go all the way to the boundary. So there's some oh, oh. things serving as the boundary. Could you yes, say something about that? Yes, it's the top of the potential barrier. It's the top of the... Um, so that's an intrinsically defined... Yeah. Place well, in the geometry? Um, I think if we make the approximation of spherical symmetry, can we do that? Yeah. yeah, then a particle in the throat or outside the throat experiences a centrifugal barrier uh, that uh, has a bump in it. That, uh, you know, it's a thing which for Schwarzschild black holes happens at 3M. That's a high, now, in the near extremal black hole, that potential barrier is very high. So a thermal particle experiences an enormously high potential barrier. Where if near extremal, the, the thermal particle has very low energy. So the thermal particle almost certainly gets bounced back. Even the S wave gets almost certainly bounced back into the black hole. And in that sense, there's a kind of dynamical isolation of the interior and the exterior. And that's where I would be inclined to put the, uh, the boundary. That would seem to me the best place to define a boundary and to try to represent the boundary uh, in terms of a, um, uh, a York, Gibbons, Hawk, uh, Hawking um, term. Does that okay. make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So from the complexity perspective, um, can you think about how to distinguish um, uh, an approximately local gravitational theory versus a very non-local one where, for example, string effects could be large. Is there some condition, like a okay. holographic condition, that we can I, I don't have a simple answer to that, but I, I think this raises the question about sub-ADS locality. 
Okay, so SYK and this story is not sub ADS local. It is sub ADS non local. However, there's this long throat, which is many, many, many ADS radii, and so there's an element of locality in that long uh, in that long throat. So we get to have a we get to have a local story, even though we haven't really mastered the sub ADS locality. Does that does that uh, in this context? Um, you know, one of the really big questions in my mind is how do you generalize this to higher dimensions and how do we make sense out of sub-ADS locality, which I don't know the answer to. Did that address the question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So if gravity is related to complexity, then... Well, say it again. If gravity is related to complexity, how can we distinguish gravity from acceleration? Just from, from acceleration. Well, all I mean by gravity is the tendency, uh, is the acceleration that a particle experiences when it's next to a massive object. That's okay. all I mean by gravity. If I have an engine, I wouldn't know. If you had some what? An engine, right? And I'm flying somewhere, then I wouldn't know whether I'm actually pulled there or it's some. Engine. Uh, like a rocket engine? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Space like the equivalence principle. Exactly. Oh, the equivalence, equivalence principle. Exactly. Um, Henry and I have talked about this a lot. How do we see the equivalence principle in this? Um, it's a good question. I, uh, I don't have an immediate quick answer. But of course, if you look at the rocket together with its fuel, the rocket and the fuel together don't accelerate. That's relative acceleration of the two. Um, in a gravitational field, both the rocket and the fuel would simultaneously experience a gravitational force. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have anything to add to what I said. Um, good, good. It's a good research question. Uh, uh, so, uh, go, going back to Matt's question, I was thinking about the Python slash jump. Python's lens geometries that Je Jeff spoke about. Wait, say, say it again. The Python's lens geometries. Python's lunch. Python's lunch. The Python's lunch. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So th there's something very interesting there, right? That you have a pure state where one side has very low restricted co complexity and one side has very high restricted complexity, and uh, cl clearly there's something about the state of the of the Python's lens side, which something about the state at the time slice which encodes the high complexity, right? The high uh, restricted complexity. Yeah, high restricted complexity. Yeah. Is, there, is there more to be said about that? Or is it what? Is there more to be said about uh, this fact? Like Jeff, relating is there more to be said? <laughs> <laughs> you know the story about the rabbi and his assistant? Never mind. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, we shouldn't just thank the speakers. We should also thank the organizers who have done a great job with this conference. <laughs>